Good evening and welcome to Live, Love, and Mary Wiser. We are currently on hiatus and we are recording videos and uploading them at our regular live time at 6.15. So thank you for joining us if you're here at that time or if you see it at some later date. Um, excited to announce that we will be back next Tuesday with a fantastic new season. We are looking forward to sharing with you. Uh, on our last session that's recorded, um, I wanted to share on a topic that we have not talked about, but we touched on it briefly in one of our sessions, just kind of on a list of things that you should be doing to be prepared as a single to uh, find the partner, be ready for the partner that you desire. Um, but I'm going to go more in depth. <laughs> this video actually might be a little bit longer than most, um, but I want to go more in depth talking about the topic of money. So obviously the first thing that we need to do is just have a relationship with God, be surrendered to him and be in submission to him. So we're going to skip that. We've talked about that and I'm sure we'll talk about it again at some future date. But in Genesis 2 verse 8, God planted a garden and gave it to Adam as his home. Now, home does not mean a house necessarily. Obviously, he didn't have a house, but it means a place of stability and security. And too many single people, men and women, skip this critical step and they bring instability, instability and, a lack of, and a lack of security into their marriage. You know, what am I talking about? I'm talking about money and finances. Whatever you call it, that's what we're going to talk about. Now, obviously, Adam did not need money as in currency to live uh, before sin. And he didn't have any debt in that half a day before Eve was created. Um, but we are following a principle here. You know, how did God lead Adam before he even brought him Eve? Like, even though we know that they were created on the same day, a lot of stuff happened between Adam being created and Eve being created when we look at the uh, account in Genesis chapter two. So God gave him a home. He gave him the garden to live, a place to bring the wife that he did not even know that he would need it. He didn't even know what a wife was. Uh, I mean, he just was alive himself. So um, God gave him a home. He prepared him for what he was going to bring to him later that day. <clears throat> His children were uh, supposed to find a place of joy and peace and security there, to be raised there, taking care of the garden and the animals and valuing the gifts of God in that place. In our world, we should have the same. Now, this is not just for men. All of us as singles should be creating stable homes, places where we can live securely, bring a spouse, have children, and live in joy and peace. Where there is financial instability, that can't happen. Whether it's a house, an apartment, or mobile home, or whatever. For many years of my adult life, I was terrible with money. I did not have much at first, but the more I had, the more I spent. I was in debt and always living paycheck to paycheck, no matter the size of the paycheck. And I was always stressed out and worried that something was not going to get paid or I would not be able to do the things that my friends were doing because I couldn't afford it. Now, this was difficult enough just by myself. If the lights were disconnected for a day or two, I could survive and no one would even know. The gas was turned off and I was cold. I could just add some blankets and socks. But imagine bringing a spouse and or children into that instability. And some of you don't have to imagine. You know what it's like. Too many singles are so focused on 
finding love and getting married and having a partner and all of those relationship goals that we do not take the time to actually prepare and plan for their realities. You know, our, you know, our mission statement here at A Single Mission, which I'm Lorraine, <laughs> co-founder of A Single Mission, and it is my passion to help women embrace their singleness, walk in their purpose, and prepare for the partner they desire. So money is a huge reality of that life and that preparation. And the conflict over money is always, always on the top 10 list of reasons that people get divorced. Now I'm going to have a lot of quotes and scriptures and all that. I'm going to put those in the description. Some I'm going to show on the screen, but I'm going to put those in the description for you. But uh, when comparing higher income to lower income married couples, research has found that though they value marriage similarly and disapprove of divorce similarly, lower income couples marry less and divorce more primarily due to economic factors. Again, I'll put the uh, link in the description so you can read that for yourself. Um, there are many one article says there's 12 money reasons that people get divorced. 12 reasons around money that people get divorced. And we have a responsibility as Christians to learn how to manage God's resources effectively and stably before connecting our lives with someone else and bringing them into our financial mess. I know that God is our provider, but God does not employ divinity to do the things with the human hands can do. That Christ would not use divinity to do the things that humans should be doing. If we can learn to man and we can learn to manage our money, God is not going to come down and say, stop, you know, give me that. Let me balance the the budget. Let me look at that. I don't know. We don't have checkbooks really much anymore, but God is not going to do that for us. We have to learn to do that for ourselves. So what are some of the things that we need to address financially before connecting our life with another person? And the first one is debt. The Bible says in Psalm 22, 7, the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. And I'm going to tell you, I believe that the Bible, to, the Bible is 100 percent true. And I seek to align my life with all aspects of it as I kind of continue to gain understanding. And. I'm not trying to be sacrilegious in what I'm about to say, but for me, there is almost no verse in the Bible that is more powerful than this one. It doesn't resonate, that resonates more powerfully for me than this verse. Every time I read it, I am shook because of its utter and complete verity. I mean, come on y'all, for real. If you've ever been in debt, you know that feeling. The subjugation of poverty or the slavery of debt, you will feel this verse in your core. And the Bible said it thousands of years ago. In 2020, I paid off my Capital One bill and I sold my house. And from the proceeds, I was able to secure my emancipation proclamation from one of the foremost masters in the business, Master Guard. Now, here's the thing. I had closed that account at least two years prior in my attempts to get out of bondage. But basically, I made a bunch of payments that just allowed them to keep getting rich, even while I was not able to use the card. The weight that I felt lifted when I hit submit on that payment. I'm telling if you haven't experienced that, you need to. 
Now I only have that big, you know, school loan left. And, um, but I believe that God can help me to take that weight off my shoulders eventually. Now, there are people who are going to push back on getting out of debt before marriage. They may argue that it would take too long and they are losing time with the future spouse to wait on it. Um, I say use that as motivation to do whatever it takes to eliminate it. I mean, there's no deadline for marriage. Now, if you're dating someone and you already have, then do what you can as long as they know that this debt exists then maybe I'll work on it together. Maybe they have you all come up with a plan, but I'm not saying, even though I'm not, not saying either that you shouldn't delay your wedding, maybe shrink your wedding and use that money to pay for the debt, delay the wedding for a year and then work hard to focus on paying it off. There's a lot of things you can do, but if you choose to, proceed as planned, at least keep it in your forefront that we're not going to buy a new car, buy a house or buy all these things that a lot of people tend to do when they get married um, until we pay off our debt. You know, it's difficult to make a lifetime commitment to a person when you already committed to your lender, especially if it's a big bill. I mean, if it's a few hundred dollars, that's nothing. But depending on your income, obviously it's nothing. But like typically you can pay that off relatively quickly. But, you know, if you have a like I have a hundred thousand dollar school loan, like for mass for um, grad school and all of that, like this is not a cheap um, adventure when you are living in the United States and you don't have money to just pay that. So you get loans and all that. That's a, that's a house. I mean, not anymore. It used to be a house, uh, but that's still a great deal of money. And so if you are not able to pay that off or get that forgiven or whatever it is, then your partner needs to know that this is the situation before you even get engaged. Like when you start to get serious about someone, uh, this is something that you need to be revealing to them and they need to be doing vice versa. Um, uh, marriage should not be the equivalent of a government, government bailout for one party or the other. If you are enslaved to a debtor, then you are not able to provide a stable home for your spouse because you are not even in control of your life. Like imagine if you are, you know, having uh, you're you're dating someone who has a lot of uh, back payments for child support. All of the income that you are getting into the house is not really all of the income you're getting into the house. <laughs> it's it has to be first cut by a portion every month to pay what they should be paying. I'm not saying don't pay that. I'm saying they should have been paying it all along. But now if it's like backed up, that becomes your debt too. You're, you are impacted by the debt that someone else brings into the marriage. And so, and I'm going to read a lot of quotes from this book, The Adventist Home, which I think is a great Book, be determined never to incur another debt. Deny yourself a thousand things, a thousand things, rather than run in debt. This has been the curse of your life, getting into debt. Avoid it as you would the smallpox. And I'll put the link to all of these quotes. Make a solemn covenant with God that by his blessing, you will pay your debts and owe no man anything if you live on porridge and bread. It is so easy in preparing your table to throw out of your pocket 25 cents for extras. Obviously, let's adjust for inflation. This was written in the 1900s. Take care of the pennies and the dollars will take care of themselves. It is the mites here and the mites there, the small amounts there that are spent for this, that, and the other that soon run up into dollars. 
Deny self at least while you are walled in with debt. Do not falter, be discouraged, or turn back. Deny your taste. Deny the indulgence of appetite. Save your pennies and pay your debt. Work them off as fast as possible. When you stand forth a free man or woman, again, owing no one anything, you will have achieved, have achieved a great victory. And when you have achieved this victory, you'll be that much more prepared for the serious commitment that is marriage. For in that relationship, you will be required to deny yourself. You will be held to a solemn co covenant. You will have to take care of all the little things. You cannot falter or be discouraged or turn back. If you learn how to do all that with your money, your marriage will also be a great victory for the glory of God and the perfecting of your character. The second thing that we need to talk about is money management. Yes, budgeting, <laughs> budgeting. <laughs> we call it something fancy, but this call it's budgeting. Many, very many, have, this is a quote as well, have not so educated themselves that they can keep their expenditures within the limit of their income. They do not learn to adapt themselves to circumstances and they borrow and borrow again and again and become overwhelmed in debt. And consequently, they become discouraged and disheartened. All should learn how to keep accounts. Some neglect this work as non-essential, but this is wrong. All expenses should be accurately stated. Again, this was written in the 1800s, early 1900s. And she was speaking to the church to say, stop doing that. Stop living like that. Take care of your money. Get out of that budget. Budget is the most hated word among those who are reckless with their money. At some point, I knew that I wanted to do right. But the requirement of consistency and self-denial kept me in a vicious cycle of starting and stopping a budget or money management plan. Thomas Tusser, Tusser wrote in a poem 460 years ago, something that remains true today. <laughs> a fool and his or her money are soon parted. But that all changed when I stepped into a Financial Peace University class. It was there at a church in Richmond in the fall of 2011 that I walked into a class that literally changed my life. I learned about this thing called zero-based budget, which is not restrictive so much as it just requires you to designate where money goes every month before the month comes. You get to decide within the obvious parameters of what bills you have to pay, where the money goes and how much of it goes there. When I made a plan for my money, I literally had extra at the end of the month when before I was always praying for the next paycheck. I started an emergency fund and had money for emergencies. As Dave Ramsey says, I started telling my money where to go instead of wondering where it went. That was real freedom. Within a few months, I was house hunting. And in January of 2013, I closed on my house. I love that house. <laughs> the benefits from that one class were and buying the house were innumerable, both financially, socially, emotionally, and practically. And I was able to later earn rent on that home as income and then sell it for a considerable profit. And it all started with doing a monthly budget. <laughs> if you are in debt or irresponsible with money and you are blessed to still be single, do not even consider getting hitched until God in partnership with you correct this issue in your life. Now, I cannot recommend Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University more. Not only have I taken the class twice, but I've also facilitated it three times. Um, but the most important part is that 
it comes from a completely biblical perspective. But the fact is, however you choose to get this part of your life in control, just do it. There are many options. You're not restricted to that. That just worked for me. But if you can come up with something else or there's some other plan, there's many other plans. You just have to do them. It's like being um, trying to lose weight. There are thousands of plans, but the only one that will help you lose weight is the one that you actually stick to. So you must allow God to give you a home that is financial stability and security before inviting anyone else in. The next part I want to discuss is financial planning. Now, I know financial planning sounds super boring. <laughs> and I know that you are about to like click off this video and go watch something else. But or start, you know, <laughs> scrolling on social media. But wait, like seriously. You know, we are all adults watching this and partaking in this conversation. Stop avoiding the thing that is keeping you stuck. Now, some people might say, I'm doing pretty good for myself. Well, is that really the aim of your life? When you were a kid, you dreamed of being pretty good? You think God created you to be pretty good? Well, I'm much better off than fill in the blank. Or did God create you just to be better off than some other person? The homeless in America are better off than the homeless in many other countries. Does that mean they are all good? Well, I don't need a will. I don't have anything. Sound familiar? <laughs> Anyone out there? And stop over-spiritualizing finances too. God will provide all my needs. Money is the root of all evil or the best one. You all have heard it before, probably. It's harder for a rich man to get into heaven than a camel through the eye of a needle. That's, that's clearly my favorite. True. In some sense, God does provide our, not, not in some sense, God does provide our needs. And what we need is an income, a job or a business, a budget in a plan for the money he gives us the strength to gain. In Deuteronomy 8, verse 18, the Bible says, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto the Father, as it is this day. Now, what it doesn't say is, he gives them wealth, right? It says he gives them power to get wealth. I kind of emphasize that so you all should. That means they had to do something, but he was the source of the power they needed to do that something, whatever that thing was, whether they were a carpenter or a farmer or a gardener or whatever, that's what they he gave them the power and the skills to do that thing. Now, this verse is a reminder to the children of Israel who had gotten <clears throat> kind of beside themselves with the idea that they had been the source of the good and the wealth that they were experiencing. Now, I believe that the problem of being self-dependent is still true. But the solution that is that it is really God that gives us power to get wealth is also true. He didn't say to get by or to get enough or to be pretty good. He said to get wealth. Now, if we know anything about God, we know that the purpose of that was to be a witness of God's provision and a blessing to all the nations that they encountered. Israel did a very poor job of that. But God did not stop being God because Israel messed up his plan. He still blesses us financially now so that we can be a witness and a blessing to others. And I also think that 
our poverty, our lack, our inability to help others in any way more significant and fair and frankly, far less significant than people who don't claim God at all is also a witness. Not a good one. It is a witness of God and basically God's quote unquote impotence that so many of the people who call his name, who say, uh, you know, he's a cattle on a thousand hills and then we don't even have one cow or any hills and we don't got nothing to actually invest in people like as part of our witness we should be turning neighborhoods around we should be creating businesses that people have jobs or can get jobs and can so, you know we should be helping people to build their practical life but we don't even have the resources to take care of our own life let alone those in our community. So I think it tells a story about, it tells a false narrative of, of God and his willingness to give us that power, to help us to grow so that we can be serving others in the community. Financial planning is committing to protecting and wisely using the money that God has given you the power to get. That is the main way that he supplies our needs. Now, this verse that is coming up is one verse that seriously gets twisted on a regular basis. The Bible is clear in 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Money is not the root. The love of money is the root. The love of money is the root. Money is not an end goal. It is a means goal. The end is not to just have money, or at least it should not be. The end is to be able to provide for our needs and invest in others in the kingdom of God. The means is by creating wealth. Money is simply a tool that we use to provide for our needs and as Christians, the needs of the church and others. When we have sufficient tools for what God is intending us to build, the result will be more effective and efficient for his calling. We are not called to this weird hope, poverty, hope, holy poverty. Proverbs 30, eight through nine says, remove far from me uh, vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. Yet we know plenty of Christians, of course, who were and are wealthy, who don't deny the Lord. And many people in poverty who do not steal or take God's name in vain. So what does it all mean? We should not make money our God the thing we seek after or worship. Yet neither should we venerate or idolize poverty as a measure of holiness or spirituality. Financial planning is not about loving money. It is about protecting the money you have, growing it and planning for how to use it and how it will be used in your life in service to God and others. So, so many people get to my, misinterpret Mark 10, 25, simply because they do not read Mark 10, 23 and 24. So what is this camel through the eye of a needle situation all about? Of course, I recommend reading the whole narrative as, as it kind of tells the backstory of these verses. But for our purposes, we'll cut to the chase. Um, a young ruler comes up to Jesus. What can I do to be saved? And he's like, keep the commandments. He's like, I'm doing that. And he's like, 
go sell all that you have and give to the poor. And he turns away sorrowfully because he's like, I'm not, you know, basically he's saying, I'm not going to do that. And so Jesus looks around and saith unto them, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said unto them, children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And there's different, you know, kind of theories or I've heard different sermons about what this um, eye of a needle thing is. But the reality is the point is in the previous verse where it says for those that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. But then we also miss. Verse 27. And this is critical. Jesus is looking upon them and he says, with men, it is impossible but not with God, for with God, all things are possible. The missing piece to many people's criticism of rich people and wealth is the trust part. Are they trusting in their wealth? That is what is keeping them from God, not the money itself. There are no signs in heaven that say no rich people allowed. Point is, if we trust in wealth, our own goodness, other people, science, or anything other than Jesus, even if we trust in our poverty as some sort of holiness, we still will not see the kingdom of God. So now that we've gotten excuses out of the way, let's talk about what financial planning for Christians should look like. Because it should look a bit different than what Valak and AIG and Charles Schwab are doing. Um, let's start with ties. Yes, did she say it? Yes, she did. She did it first. And primary step in your financial plan is to return unto God a tenth of all your income. Yes, a tenth. Fun fact, tenth is literally what tithe means in Hebrew. God's requirement comes first. We are not doing his will if we con if we consecrate to him what is left of our income after all our imaginary wants have been supplied. Before any part of our earnings is consumed, we should take out and present to him that portion which he claims. In the old dispensation, <laughs> an offering of gratitude was kept continually burning upon the altar thus showing man's endless obligation to God. If we have prosperity in our secular business, it is because God blesses us. A part of this income is to be devoted to the poor and a large portion to be applied to the cause of God. When that which God claims is rendered to him, the remainder will be sanctified and blessed to our own use. But when a man robs God by withholding that which he requires, his curse rests upon the whole upon the whole. We should be tithing. CDF Capital was founded in 1953 with a single mission. You like that? <laughs> That's actually what it says, a single mission. Um, not the same single mission I have. That's the point. Everyone has a mission. It's to help churches grow. That was that was what their mission is. And in their article entitled Significant Statistics About Tithing and Church Generosity, they state that there are 247 million U.S. citizens that identify as Christians, but only 1.5 million tithe. Did you did you get that? <laughs> I did the math for you, but I'm like just 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 that simple fact. 
there are 247 million U.S. citizens that identify as Christian, but only 1.5 million of them tithe. That is zero. That's 0 0.006 percent. It's not even one percent. <laughs> 0.006% of people who identify as Christians, Christians, i.e. meaning follower of Christ. <laughs> I mean, that was so pathetic that I could hardly like get myself together when I calculated that number. I kept like redoing it to me. I'm like, did I do that right? I kept looking at it like it could not really be true. But hey, if you give the calculator the right information, it will not lie to you. There are so many arguments and articles about why we no longer need to tithe and that is an Old Testament practice that is not relevant anymore, blah, 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 blah. Here's why I tithe and why I teach that any follower of Christ will do so. Jesus said to do it. Malachi 3, 8 through 11, Matthew 23, 23. Please read those on your own. Psalm 50 verse 12 says, it all belongs to God and he allows us to keep most of his money. <laughs> Matthew 6, 33, I trust him to take care of me when I obey him. I was not always this way. Like in my early 20s, I struggled with this because I already told you all I had struggled with paycheck to paycheck. So like giving up that 10% for tithe and offering 5% at least. We should be giving 5% of our offering. That's a different topic for a different day, but we should be giving offering. I was giving 5%. So I was living paycheck to paycheck and I was just like getting like stop. I didn't like sometimes I did, sometimes I didn't, but then I felt guilty because I believed in it. So then I started keeping track of my debt to God. <laughs> like, oh, this was supposed to, you know, be, let's say I was supposed to pay, you know, give return, let's just round numbers, $150, but I didn't. So now I would keep track of it. So like whenever I got paid, it's like, oh, now it's $300 or whatever. So one Sabbath, I just get like seriously convicted on this thing. So then I like pay back. All the back tithe. I don't like, is that a thing really? But that's what I did. <laughs> and from then on, you know, I've been faithful in this area um, that I was previously weak. Like, and I have seen God's provision. You know, there were times when I returned tithe when my rent was going to be late. Um, and, you know, like that's major, but I did it and God provided. He is faithful even when we are not faithful. But he promises in Malachi a blessing beyond capacity when we are faithful to him. It is not a Christian financial plan if it doesn't include tithe. Now, that's just my two cents, but I think God would agree with me. We got to save. It is important for everyone to save because the rain will come. If you do not have an umbrella, you will get drenched. For singles, this is amplified because we typically have only one source of income. If that income decreases or, God forbid, is eliminated, having savings or an emergency if the fund is like the difference between that income loss being a major crisis versus a minor challenge. Now, you might today, here's another quote, you might today have had capital of means to use in the case of emergency and to aid the cause of God if you had economized as you should. Every week, a portion of your wages should be reserved and in no case touched unless suffering actual want or to render back to the giver in offerings to God. There's another quote. The means you have earned has not been wisely and economically expended so as to leave a margin should you be sick and your family deprived of the means you bring to sustain them? Your family should have something to rely upon if you should be brought into straightened places or difficult places uh, financially. For most of my life, I did not have a consistent, consistent savings plan. 
the main reason for that is that I had no financial plan at all. <laughs> I just paid stuff, bought stuff and hoped that it would last until the next checks when I needed to pay some more stuff and buy some more stuff. When crisis came and it did, the sister girl was struggling. <laughs> when I met Dave Ramsey, not literally, but in Financial Peace University, I started a regular savings plan. The first step is to save. It's like baby steps. And the first step is to save $1,000. And I did it. I mean, it was so freeing and empowering. I was not afraid every minute about not being able to address an issue with my car or in my life because of a lack of funds. And the funny thing is crisis, crises decreased when my savings increase because everything is a crisis when you don't have the money <laughs> and it causes significant stress in your life. But now when you have the money, it's just a minor bump because you have a safety net. Save, save something. Even if you're struggling, save something, a dollar, five, ten dollars a week or even a month. If you've heard my testimony, you know that I'm in a financial difficult time and it's been going on for a while now. But even as I was preparing this, I'm just like, I need to get back to saving consistently anytime I get any money, even if it is just a dollar or five dollars or ten dollars a week or whenever I get it. But before you know it, if you keep that habit, it will build. But the most important part is that you will be establishing a habit. Um, and it will begin to relieve worry about the next money crisis. You will also begin to recognize the difference between your wants and your needs as you discipline yourself to include your savings. Hebrews 12, 11 says, no discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. Yep, this is true. It's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. Now, let me be clear on this point that I'm not saying hoarding or just building up money to store for yourself. Like the rich fool in Luke 12 16 through 21, your end will be a tragic one if this is your mindset. However, many would use that story to say not to save at all, because Jesus goes on to say that a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth. And indeed, he did say that. But like the camel through the eye of a needle story, people leave out a critical part of the statement that he made. The end of that verse is, but not have a rich relationship with God. He's saying, don't store up wealth and don't have a relationship with me. He's not saying don't store up wealth. Don't, don't save money. He's saying save money and have a relationship with God. <laughs> a rich relationship with God. Not a, you know, passive mediocre relationship with God, but then have all this stored, stacked up. Saving is a critical part of a financial plan. And then you want to make a will. A will is simply a plan that you communicate legally <laughs> to your family, friends, or the executor of the will telling them what you want done with your money when you die and your belongings, and even your body in the event of your death. Those who are faithful stewards of the Lord's means will know that just how their business stands. And like wise men, like wise men and women, they will be prepared for any emergency. Should their probation close suddenly, should you die unexpectedly, they would not leave such great perplexity upon those who are called to settle their estate. You, you know, probably every one of us know some family where they had to do a GoFundMe just to pay for a small funeral because there was not preparation made. For most people, a term life insurance policy is like 
10, 12, 15 bucks a month and you can get $10,000 worth of coverage or more actually in many places, especially if you get it through your bank, like I have one sitting on my desk, I need to fill out for my credit union, you know? And so like we need to take provisions. We need to prepare so that the people when we die are not scrambling. They're trying to, you know, mourn the loss of this, their, you know, mother, father, sister, brother, spouse, child, but they can't because they have to deal with all this financial stuff because we were too lazy or too selfish or too undisciplined to make those plans now while we had the chance. And then we leave them to suffer, not just the loss of the person that they love, but suffer through all of the drama of trying to settle a state, especially when you have to settle it now with the state. A lot of times, if you don't have a will in place or you don't have a trust in place, I'm not going to get into all of the legalities of that, but um, sometimes you're not just battling with your own emotions, dealing with the loss, dealing with the family now who's fighting over this. You also got to deal with the state. <laughs> Make a will. <laughs> and and this, you know, this advice, I mean, this there are quotes in here that have come again from 1800s, early 1900s. Many are not exercised upon the subject of making their wills while they are in apparent health. But this precaution should be taken by our brethren. And you're talking about church members. They should know their financial standing and should not allow their business to become entangled. They should arrange their property in such a manner that they may leave it at any time. Wills should be made in a manner to stand the test of law. For after they are drawn, they may remain for years and do no harm. If donations continue to be made from time to time, it's the cause of need. Death will not come one day sooner, brethren or sisterin, because you have made your will. In disposing of your property by will to your relatives, be sure that you do not forget God's cause. You are his agents holding his property and his claims should have your first consideration. Your wife and children, of course, should not, or husband and children should not be left destitute. Provision should be made for them if they are needy, but do not simply because it is customary bring into your will a long line of relatives who are not needy. You know, that's another like topic in a sense, but like everyone doesn't need to get from your will. You need to make sure the people, first of all, God's plan, God's purpose, God's work is, is attended to that your, your spouse and children, even grandchildren, if that is appropriate, yes. You know, good man leaves a inheritance to his grandchildren. Okay, do that. But everybody in the family doesn't need to get some of that <laughs> when they don't need it not just to have money. Whether you have houses around the world or live in a room with a backpack and a Snuggie, the people left behind when you die need to know what to do with your stuff. Losing a loved one is hard enough without having to deal with the drama of figuring out all their business and goods because they were too selfish and immature to provide a plan for you. Yes, I said it. Being a grown up without a will is selfish and immature. I was both of those things until, you know, a few years ago, I had started several wills, but never finished them, thereby making them completely useless. And if I had died before I did that, I would have left a house, a car, payments, school loan, and a house full of stuff that no one would know what to do with. In addition, even though insurance and the investment accounts had beneficiaries attached, I wanted those funds to be distributed by the beneficiary in a specific way. That could not have happened without a will telling them how and who. A good man, good woman, leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. Now, we may be singles with children, and that is all specific command to us. However, you may be single without children like me. Does that leave you free to do it or whatever? Nope. I still believe in the village. 
I have eight nieces and nephews and five great nieces and nephews. That makes me feel old. Almost all of my friends have children. There are children in my church. There are organizations that serve children. Need I go on? All of these are our responsibility because they are God's children. Firstly, when I take care of my money, and I have a budget and I get out of debt and I have a financial plan, I can actually help children today while I'm living and leave an inheritance for some children to go to university, start a business, start a nonprofit, patent an invention, but just get a good start out in life without any debt. Wouldn't you have loved that if you to just have a good start, maybe have some the money to just pay for schools? So you don't have to worry about that. Or if you're starting a business that someone who just who left you money that you could just use to start your business and you don't have to go into debt or credit cards or whatever it is. And so like we can give someone else a leg up. We can help a family. Maybe they have three or four children. Maybe just have one and they don't have the financial means. You know, that's between them and God. But if you do, you plan and you prepare, then you can help them. Financial planning as a single is important, not just for our lives and stability, but for those that we can impact through our means and influence through our example. It is God that gives us power to get wealth. Yes, but he expects us to use wisely and plan well for the wealth that he affords us through his power. So money, 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 money. We have to talk about money. We have to learn how to use our money. We have to use how to save our money. We, don't have, we need to know how to budget our money. Money is a tool that God has gifted us at some level and, and if we use it wisely, he will give, the, give us more and more so that his purpose can be fulfilled in our lives and in the lives of those around us. Thank you for joining me on this last recorded session for this hiatus. We will see you live next Tuesday at, two, at 6.15. We have a special guest and we are excited about that. Um, and we pray that you will like this, share it. We need to get our the interest in the word out of the things that we're doing so other people can be impacted. If you are getting benefit from it, please like, hit the thumbs up button on YouTube that likes it and share it and subscribe so that we can, so YouTube can see, hey, people are interested in this. Let me share it more. Thank you. And until next time, make choices that will help you live, love, and marry wiser. God bless you.